Here we go. One, two, three. Just waking up. Oh, nearly, yeah. nearly done a counter there. You got me. Yeah. We were too close. <laughs>
getting punched in the face at a young, as a young kid, I just fell in love with the sport. And each day, and obviously when I started fighting the amateurs, each victory just built that more confidence in me, that more character. But I had that behind me from the days I was bullied, mm. the days I went through that hardship, that whatever hardship I'd go through in my career, in the amateurs or in the pros, I'd been there before. I know what it's like. So nothing was ever brand new to me. I've been there and I had to go through the fire to come out the other way. So whose idea was boxing? Uh, my, my dad's, yeah, my father's. We literally uh, wanted to lose the weight. We wanted to help with the bullies and, and, and get fitter in the off season for rugby league. And first idea was we'll go do some nippers down the beach. And I definitely was not gonna do that, <laughs> so I said no chance. <laughs> And then we said, well, what about boxing? You like uh, the Rocky films? Yeah. We're always mucking around throwing punches. So yeah, let's give it a chance. Let's, let's try it out. I remember going up the stairs, walking up to that gym. The smell alone of, of that old school gym. You could hear the leather bags, the blood on the gloves, because I didn't have my own pair. I just borrowed some from the gym there. And then I'm getting in the ring with another kid who's had a bit of experience and he's throwing punches and I'm trying my best to do whatever I could after learning about 30 minutes of it on that first day. It would drive a lot of kids out of there. They said, no chance, I'm not gonna do this. But me, I just, I just was enjoying the whole process of it. And day by day, as scary as it was, I fell in love with the sport and knew that one day I'd, I'd get to the top. Perhaps we've just seen the birth of well, the next big thing in Australian boxing, George Cambosis. Talk to me about rugby league and the part um, that that played in your early journey, because you're actually part of the development squad, Cronulla Sharks and women. You told me that uh, your dream when you were a really little kid was to be a rugby league player. So there was, you know, a moment that you came to the crossroads and you had to decide whether it was going to be rugby league yep. or boxing. Take me back to that moment and I guess the biggest considerations for you in making that decision. Yeah, I loved rugby league. Like I said, that's all I wanted to do. So when that moment came, when I made the Sharks Development Squad, I was so excited, but I had fell in love with something else. But I spoke to my father, obviously, he could see straight away that after I got picked with, for, for the Development Squad, we sat in the car and he, he knew straight away with the dates and the times, but he wanted to test me like he always has. And he said, what should we do? You know, you've got to train both days. What do you want to do? Rugby league, it's what you wanted to do. I said, well, same time as boxing. He goes, okay, well, now you have the whole weekend to make that decision. It's up to you now. No one's going to help you. No one's going to change your mind for you. This is on you because I don't want you turning back and saying, you told me to do this and I should have done that. Yep. So he came back on Monday from my hard days of work and he, uh, he had told me the, the night before, I want to see which bag's there, your boxing bag or your rugby league bag. So when he came back, the boxing bag was there. He goes, you made the decision? I said, yep, I'm gonna be a fighter. Did you have to tell Ricky Stewart what were the discussions that you had with the Sharks at that time? I never got to t tell him. My dad said, okay, I'll take you to the boxing gym and I'll take the team gear, the rep uh, jerseys and, and training gear. I'm gonna take it back to the team. And I know they were pretty disappointed, but I had a mission to, to achieve. From that day, I handed the, uh, the footy gear back and I took the boxing gear with me, I was all in. And I get goosebumps thinking about it because I know how hard this journey has been. No one gave me anything. I had to really earn it. And that's, that's what I did and that's what I'll continue to do. So what would you say were the early lessons for you in, I guess, focus and commitment in boxing? I knew that when you work hard and you push yourself to that extreme limits, you will have success. And I worked very hard for my first ever amateur fight, even at a 13 year old young kid. I still remember it so clearly like it was yesterday. I remember I was too young to fight in New South Wales. So we flew to Queensland and we had to wait the whole day to fight. I remember being warming up since 11 o'clock in the morning and I didn't fight till about 10, 11 at night with how big the draw was and so many amateur fighting, uh, fighters. And then when I finally put the gloves on, they had already been used throughout the whole tournament. They were drenched in sweat, blood everywhere all on them. We're cleaning them all up. You can just smell that rawness for a kid that was so tall, about six foot at 46 kilos. And I remember just 
it was like an Olympic swimming race. <laughs> Punches going everywhere. And uh, started getting into my zone, getting into my groove and started working the jab. Started bringing all the things I had learnt in my uh, training and up winning the fight. And that's the first taste of victory, first taste of, of glory. I had my medal, my Golden Gloves medal, and I didn't take it off for about two weeks. That's how proud I was and couldn't wait for the next one. So that's what drew, drew me, that success, the winning feeling. And I knew that the harder I worked, the more success I would have. That raw determination, that, that discipline. Do you remember the moment where you realised that your passion for boxing could actually be your profession, where you could actually take it to the next level and pursue it as a career? I think as my amateur career progressed, maybe 10, 15 amateur fights deep, that's when it really started to kick in. That's where I thought, I'm good at this, I'm winning. I'm getting better and better every fight. And I started getting all my favourite fighters and the professionals, looking at them, watching them, studying them for hours and hours. While I should have been doing schoolwork and homework, I was studying all, studying all these greats, writing my, my notes on all of them. And that's where that love first started to really kick in, that fire you know, became you know, a roaring blaze. And I knew that I can be world champion one day. And as my career progressed more and more, that vision became clearer and clearer. <laughs> Get that head off, son. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Roll up. That's it. Tell me about the significance of the number 301. 301 is very important to me. I've had that uh, number for many years. You know, I think before my amateur days, you know, as I was coming up, 301 is, we've got the 300 Spartans. Well, there's one more here on the world scene. You know, showing the world what we're about the bloodlines we have, the sacrifice and dedication that we bring into everyday life. You know, a very proud Australian, a very proud Greek as well. You know, my family comes from Sparta. And it's a, a great, amazing um, feeling, great honour to be able to you know, represent the flag, represent the Australian flag and the Greek flag. We're both fighting nations. I look at myself as an uh, Anzac Spartan. You, know, you can't beat that mix. When I stepped in there June 5th, Devon Haney never, never has been in there with a guy like myself. And Anzac Spartan, it's a different breed. You are your grandfather's namesake. Yes. Tell me a little bit about him and your relationship with him and what he means to you and how proud he was of you and everything that you've achieved, not just in your boxing, but in your personal life as well. Yeah, look, uh, family's everything. You know, I tried to be the best role model, the best father to my kids and to show them that with hard work, anything can be achieved. You know, both my grandfathers played a, a huge role. My grandf one of my grandfathers who's alive actually made the trip to Madison Square Garden wow. at 83 years of age, so he was so proud. Unfortunately, my other grandfather, George Cambosis, who I'm named after, couldn't be there physically. I know spiritually he was there. Mm -hmm. I know he was inside that ring with me. I say that I had to lift myself up, but I believe that he helped me as well in that round 10. He was there lifting me up as well and I get goosebumps talking about it. But, you know, he was a strong man, took risk in life to come to Australia, to a place where he couldn't speak the language. He had to work two, three jobs, built his family. And I know how proud he is. I know he was so proud every time we sat down. You know, when are you gonna fight for your title? When are you gonna be world champion? I know you'll be world champion. I knew that date. When it came, I knew he'd be so proud to watch, but unfortunately, uh, you know, two months before the fight, you know, he passed away. Mm. And on the same day, my son was born. So it's, it's a, it was a, a, a funny feeling that day, a real happy, sad, sad, happy day, mm. where the passing of my grandfather, the birth of my son, but I knew they took each other's place. And I knew that that day was the most important day for me leading into this fight because I trained that night. I knew that if I couldn't be broken that night, that how would I be broken in the Lopez fight? I'd be unbreakable. So take us into your mindset that night. What were your thoughts? What, what was your emotion? What were you really focused on? You know, it was a crazy moment. My uh, son was born, but at the same time, 
my grandfather lost his breath and literally went into a, into a coma and mm -hmm. eventually passed away three, four hours later. Now, I could have been broken that night, but I didn't. I didn't go into the gym. I went onto the road, the place where champions are made on the road. You put in your miles late at night. And that's what I did. Something that I've always felt comfort in, running. That night I didn't even put the earphones in, I just ran. And I knew that as hard as it is today, when so much has happened, I had to do this, I had to run. Now, it didn't make me any fitter. I was already in supreme yeah. condition, but it wasn't about the fitness. It was about this, it was about being unbreakable. And that's what I did that night. Leading into that fight with Lopez, you were pegged as the underdog. Was that something that you were acutely aware of? And do you feel like that underdog status actually worked in your favour? Well, I'm still the underdog, even against Devin Haney. So I was a big underdog against Tiafima Lopez. Some of the odd makers had me you know, 13 to 1. But I embrace it. I love being the underdog. It just fuels me even more. They can keep putting me as the underdog. They can keep trying to deny me. They can keep saying that you ain't going to get through this fight, but that motivates me. Lopez was so vocal about a round one knockout, obsessed with it. He kept saying it over and over again. How did that sit with you and how did it inspire you, I guess, in your game plan when you were formulating how you would take him on, when you were assessing what his weaknesses were and how you would begin that fight? Well, it goes down to patience. I knew he was impatient. I knew he was focus on one thing, but was not ready for what would happen if that round one didn't happen? What happens if you're on the receiving end? Like, I put him down. Oh, what a right hand from George Campos! And the takeover went down! T.O. Field just got dropped! Can you believe this? He really thought that, who's this Aussie? He's not gonna do this to me. He can't hang with, with me. I'm, I'm the top dog. I'm the guy who just beat Lomachenko. I've been knocking everyone out. What's he gonna do to me? But like I said, I'm a different breed, cut from a different cloth and I just knew that when we're in there and I do land my shots, I will see your face change. And like when I put him down in round one, that face expression just totally changed and he just realized this is not that Aussie that I, that I thought yeah. I was gonna be fighting. This guy's a different breed. And round by round, that's the game plan we always had. Round by round, we'll break him down. And by the end of the fight, his face was that battered that only a mother could love that face. <laughs> and the new, new IBO, WBO, WBA, WBC franchise, and Ring Magazine lightweight champion of the world, George Ferocious Cambosa. One of the biggest Junior. upsets you will. What did you learn about yourself on that night, in that victory? That night, I knew that I finally belonged there. I finally joined the club of being a world champion, but also I knew that the other, the wolves will come. Now I've got that big target on my back because I've got every belt. So I embrace that, that target. It makes me sharper than ever because every corner, there's someone trying to take what I've got. And when you've got something to lose, you're more dangerous than ever, I believe. Do you remember what it felt like to have those belts in your hands? Uh, heavy, <laughs> definitely heavy after the 12 round fight, <laughs> but a great feeling. You know, all them years, all the hard work, all the sacrifice, but more important you know, to the people that didn't believe me, to my family who, who supported me so much, my father hold, holding me up, my wife there yep. crying, <laughs> you know, to my kids watching at home, you know, that, that was the amazing feeling to the Australian public, to the Greek public, to knowing that he's your world champion, the guy who did it from the, from the trenches, the guy who did it the hardest way, here it is. This is the hard work to show it, but that's not where it ends. That's not the full stop and I didn't get caught up on the belts. The belts are great, that's a piece of it. it. It's about what I do in the ring and what I do from this point on. George, you're a dedicated family man and I always love to see you whenever we talk about your family, a big smile comes up on your face. They are so proud of you. Tell me what that moment was like when you got home as the world champion and you finally got to see them and hold them in your arms and celebrate in your own way with them what you just achieved. Yeah, it was a beautiful feeling. 
the airport was, was so crazy though. There were so many people there and uh, my kids come running up. I hadn't seen them for, for a fair bit, so yeah. they had changed again. And they always do every time I go away, I come back and, and they change. So it was a great feeling because like I said, they sacrifice as well their way. Not just a normal dad, not uh, you see him every day and you're with him, you get to spend so much time with him. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't get to do that. But it's, it's for a reason, there's a purpose behind it. And I'll have plenty of time to, to spend with them when it's all said and done. But for now, they know that dad's got business to handle and he'll continue handling business. And you know, they've already said it. They know who I'm fighting next. And they already said, daddy, go do the business. <laughs> I want to ask you about Manny Pacquiao and your relationship with him and how that all began. Yep. How many sparring rounds do you reckon you've done with him? Oh, I've now? said it many times. <laughs> uh, over 250 rounds, wow. plenty of rounds, three world total campaigns. But that time with him, you know, was, that was gold. And I, would have, uh, I would have paid to, 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 to be with him. Yep. You know, obviously he had me as his sparring partner for three world total campaigns. I got to learn you know, what it's like to prepare for the championship fights, what it's like to be in the trenches for 12 rounds. Everything he did, I did. Everything he was running, doing the pads, sparring, I was doing side by side. Now at that stage, I was fighting on his undercards. I was fighting the smaller rounds fights, the eight rounders. So I knew deep down when my big fights came, my 12 round fights came, my world title eliminators, my world championship fights, my defenses came. I'd be ready because I put in the work with an all-time great. Mm -hmm. I know what I have to do. And that, that definitely helped me. And obviously after my great win, he put out his, his tweet and reached out and was so proud and so happy. And, you know, as an idol of mine, someone that I, I idolised from a young kid, you know, just to see that even after the biggest win of my life and becoming champion, I was so happy to see that. <laughs> that actually made me more excited than anything else. Yeah. So, George, why was it so important to you to bring this fight with Devin Haney back to Australia? It's extremely important because not only it's been so long since I fought in Australia, but Australia was owed this. They deserved this. They needed this. Doesn't matter how much money they would throw overseas, it was coming here. It could have been for zero dollars here, but it was coming here no matter what. And I made that clear, not only on the biggest night of my life in the ring, November 27th, but for every negotiation, for every bit of my next fight talk, I'm fighting in Australia, they have to now come and feel what it's like to be on the other side, to be on away territory, because I've done it so many times. Mm. But I'm just exci I'm so excited to see you know, the support and the, and the crowd there and, and every bit of it, that it just drives me even more. Every punch I throw you know, is it, it, gonna be for so much purpose. Have you taken a little moment to have a think about what it's going to sound like, what it's going to look like, what it is actually going to feel like to walk into that stadium, to get into the ring at Marvel Stadium? It's, as you say, it's been a long time, five years since you fought in Australia. Do, do you give yourself that little luxury to just dream about what it, all those things are going to feel like? Now, the crowd is just an added bonus for me. But there's been times I fought with no crowd, so... <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm just so focused, so zoned in, and it's, it really, uh, it's, it's an amazing feeling. You know, when you step in, onto Marvel Stadium, like I did for the uh, first press conference, and just look around, and I did manifest it there, I visualized it, I saw it, I felt the sound, I felt the ground shaking, I know what it's gonna be like, so, you know, I've had this dream for a long time. I've, I've dreamt about it, I've said it many years ago that I'll become world champion, and I'll bring the belts back home to a stadium fight. So I've seen this before. This is not something new. As much as it's my first big stadium fight in Australia, I've visualised it, I've seen it, I've manifested. So, you know, this is uh, yeah, again and again for me. George, you're a details-focused athlete. You study and consider every little detail of your opponent. How do you see Haney? Have you been able to unlock anything in his repertoire that you feel like you'll be able to exploit on June 5th? Many holes. There are so many holes that the pinpoint shots that I land, the sharpness, the speed, the movement, the explosive power, the footwork, the ring IQ, my defensive work, it's just gonna be too much for him. I see the holes, my team sees the holes, and every day we put in the work to continue making sure that every hole that he has 
will be uh, punished for his mistakes. Have you got a round one knockdown punch just like you had for Lopez for Devin Haney? I'll be ready. I'll be ready <laughs> for, from round one to round 12. I never uh, come into the, to the fight looking for a certain shot. I just do what I do best in the ring. I keep my sharpness, my awareness, and bring everything I have plus more. Now as a champion, now fighting back home, now knowing my kids are ringside, I bring everything with me to make sure that I take out another one, another big name, another guy that they say he's, he's a certain king of the lower division. Well, this emperor is still taking them out one by one. Are you a different fighter coming into this fight with Devin Haney than you were going into the fight with Lopez? Definitely. Think? A better fighter, a sharper fighter, a stronger fighter. As soon as I beat Tia from my Lopez, I sat down with my team and said, OK, we reached the top. How do we get better? Instead of, let's go celebrate, let's go enjoy. No. How do we get better? So I got stronger. I got faster. I lifted heavier. I did more rounds. I game planned more. I worked on things that weren't my, my positives and made them a positive. So I'm definitely a hundred times better fighter and I can't wait to show it June 5th and to continue beating the best. Legacy is important to you. What do you want your legacy to be? Exactly that. Legacy is so important to me. The Australian public will know in the world, the boxing world, the sporting world, the general public will know that George Cambasas Jr. never took no shortcut, chased the best, earned it the hardest way, and fought whoever was in front of him, the biggest name as possible, to continue winning, to continue showing that that little underdog, that guy that was bullied, that would come last, that was never given a chance, can reach the top and can sit there forever. George, I hope you know June 5th, but always we're in your corner. I really, wishing you all the very best. I really appreciate it. I know Australia's in my corner, Greece in my corner, and I can't wait to make you proud. That's, that's the most important thing. I'll continue to do what I do best in the ring, but bringing pride and honour to the country is the most important thing for me. You've done that already. Thank you, George. Thank you.